just comforting to be in the house of the Lord and to worship. And when you think about our opportunity to worship together, it should never be taken lightly. And so from the moment you pulled up on the campus, you should have been excited knowing that you would be shoulder to shoulder with others who are worshiping the Lord. Uh, perhaps in your serving around the campus, perhaps while you were uh, in a life group, perhaps while you were standing in worship through song, perhaps while you were worshiping through giving, perhaps while you were worshiping through prayer. But regardless of the fact, there should have been excitement because when you came to worship with others, you should have already been excited from a personal, individual standpoint worshiping the Lord. And so, uh, of course, you know how it is when uh, there's one person excited, that's one thing. When there's 10 people excited, it's another thing. When it turns into 100 or more, uh, there should be some noise. Uh, it, it should be less ability to contain it. And it's, it's amazing how we have the opportunity to express ourselves freely, not only in God's house, but even in our own house, even at the grocery store. You, you do know if you go to uh, Publix or Chick-fil-A or Walmart or Popeye's or one of those places and uh, you start lifting up the Lord. Now, you do know they might uh, look at you strange, but most likely you won't be arrested for what they call causing a disturbance. Uh, you just telling me you couldn't help yourself. You got to thinking about someone and you got all excited and uh, you, they, they might think you're excited about the chicken. But you tell them I'm excited about a person, a person named Jesus. But listen, all I'm trying to encourage you to do is don't hold it back until you come into a place that they call a church because a church is made up of believers all around the world. So you don't have to contain it. That's, that's the whole point. And now we're going to worship by journeying through the Word of God. And yes, we have an objective when we go through the Word of God. It is that we may have a face-to-face -face encounter with the author and the finisher, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. It is that we may have an encounter with him, and it is impossible to have an encounter with God and walk away unchanged. Now, you can deny it. If you want to, you can refuse to obey it, but it's impossible to come face to face with God and walk away unchanged. So let us journey through God's word together. If you don't mind, take your Bibles, phone, with your Bible app, hold it up high and repeat after me. This is my Bible, the word of God, and inside, God tells me the plans he has for my life. He tells me how much he loves me, even when this world tells me that I'm not lovable. And I shall be all that God desires for me to be because his Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. And this I proclaim in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn your attention to the book of James, your may say letter of James, epistle of James, and we're in chapter one. We're going to begin at verse 19. Uh, as you still turn to James chapter 1 verse 19, I would like to encourage you, if you can, by all means, 
be here on Wednesday night. There are several opportunities that you can be engaged with, uh, whether it's a finance class, um, uh, gentlemen's doing a wonderful job uh, in this financial class, and I'm telling you, if you struggle in your finances, uh, your life might do a 180 by just attending, uh, because unfortunately, uh, sometimes believers, we're told what to do with 10%, but many of us don't give the 10% because we struggle on how to live with the 90%, which is why the average believer doesn't even give. And so, because they, they don't put themselves in a position. Also, they do not put themselves in a position to save. And so, we as a church, we care about your life. We care about your family. And so, we want you to spend wisely. We want you to save wisely because retirement's coming. There's also some things that may need to be done. If you need your roof changed on your house, different things like that. The, the, the class will teach you how to save for short term, long term, how to invest, how to manage, how to be responsible. Listen, don't let Starbucks take all your money. I used to tell young folks when I was a student pastor, they rush out and um, some, some of them would rush out and buy uh, Michael Jordan shoes and polo, sh Ralph Lauren shirt. And I would share with them, I said, listen, I got on a polo shirt. Uh, and a polo shirt, by the way, is just a shirt with two collars, usually has two or three buttons. That's, that's a polo shirt. And they would say, no, a polo shirt has this man on top of a horse. I said, no, that's not what a polo, then that's Ralph Lauren who utilizes a polo shirt. I have on a polo shirt. I said, what's the difference between you and my shirt? They said, well, uh, it, it's a big difference. It's, it's the cost. I said, yeah, but... Think about this now. Yours have a man on it on top of a horse. Mine doesn't. I might have a donkey on mine. <laughs> but yours is made out of 100% cotton. Mine is too. Yours has a collar. So is mine. Yours has two or three buttons. But yours costs like $70, $80. Mine costs $15 to $20. That leaves me $35 to $45 to spend in a different way. And I don't think Michael Jordan needs you to buy his shoes to live. I think he got enough. I think, he, I think he's all right. All right? So, 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 but attend the class. Also, if you're looking for a Bible study, currently I'm taking, uh, 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 we're going through the book of John. We're in chapter 1. If you come now, you're in a good place. I think we're on verse 7 or 6. So we come, we... <laughs> We're on verse 6 or 7. Just come on, uh, get involved. Also, if you say, I'm coming straight from work, they, listen, they have dinner here. They serve it from 5 to 6.30. It's an hour and a half to get yourself in here and eat and uh, very good food cooked right here in the kitchen. So j just, just come on board. There's also tutoring that's taking place. If, you, if your child needs some tutoring, that's tutoring. That's all kind of things, to, and that's so many other things, uh, but I, I didn't supposed to say all this stuff. I know I'm supposed to be reading, but I'm just telling you, listen, you can get deeper in this word on Wednesdays also. James, chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Let's pray. Father, we pray now that your word will find its proper place in our heart, that it may not be snatched away by circumstances, by distractions, by the flesh, by this world. But Father, help us to live your word out that we may truly honor you and glorify you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, for 
a few minutes this morning, I, I would like to share with you uh, from this series that we have been going through from the book of James called Faith Works. And I want to talk with you on the subject matter of do the right thing. And, and, and next week, we're going to pick up on do the right thing. But this week, I want to just spend some time right here in these uh, three verses where we are encouraged by James to do the right thing. Remember that the Jewish Christians during James' day, when James wrote this particular epistle, he, epistle, he, he was sharing it with Jewish believers that had been scattered abroad. They were under uh, persecution. They were under attack from outside of the church and also from within. They were being tested on all kind of fronts. They were being tested on their finances. They were being tested on their uh, beliefs and, and so on. And here, though, James wants to talk to them about a specific matter because many of these believers are holding on just by their fingertips. They're, 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 they are about to break. How many and how often does a believer go through a particular trial in their life? And they are on the verge of giving up. Maybe they have had enough of other believers that they believe don't properly honor God. Maybe they're upset with God because something tragic happened in their, house, uh, in their home or in their life. And they say, God, if you truly were God, you would not have let this happen to me. And many have become angry, bitter, being consumed with rage and with wrath. James tells them to do the right thing, to do the right thing. Well, I think about all of the opportunities we have as believers to grow in the Word in order to help us face the various trials that we go through, whether it's the trial of temptation, whether it's the trial of our finances, or whether it's the trial uh, that is consumed with uh, receiving the Word of God. Here, James wants them to deal with the matter of allowing the Word of God to have its proper place in them, that they may be properly filled, uh, properly matured and completed as believers. And so, this was a different time, though, than what we live in. At the time that James shared this epistle, James, the book of James is considered to be the first book written out of the New Testament. So these believers would not have had the Gospels of, had the book of Acts or had the book of Romans. And I think about what they did not have in comparison to what we do have. So we have Bibles. And not only do we have Bibles, we have various sizes of Bibles. We have Bibles that come with different fonts in it. You can get the 8, you can get 16 if you have, if your eyes require it. There's also uh, apps that you can listen to the Bible. They also have the Bible written in Braille. And Many don't even have a literal Bible such as this. They may have a Bible app on their iPad or maybe they may have it on their phone. But we have it all at our fingertips. In, in, in fact, anywhere you are, you have access to it. And I think about all of the books that have been published. They say that each day 5,000 new books are published. Did you know that this year that there will be 8.3 trillion text messages sent around the world? 2.27 trillion in the United States alone. 23 billion text messages, or SMS, which stands for short message service, uh, will be sent, 23 million, around the world 
uh, are sent around the world on a daily basis. Six billion of that 23 billion in the United States alone. That comes up to 180 billion for the United States per month. Surprisingly, the United States is not number one in sending text message. It's actually the Philippines because they choose not to use the other social media platforms and online services as much as text messages. Text messaging, social media, emails, we have all of this means of communicating with one another. We have the Bible. So also, so if I didn't have the Bible, I have the ability to communicate with someone else who may have a Bible so that I can gain knowledge about the Word of God. Yet, with all of this technology we have at our fingertips, are we any better off than the believers during that particular century? Because during that particular century, what they had was teachers who would teach the Word of God, and believers would have to listen carefully to the Word of God, they would have to focus on memorizing the Word of God, and then they would meditate on the Word of God. Word of God. But more actually were inclined to the Word of God than those of us today who have it all at our fingertips. James is going to make a clear point about what the Word should be doing in our life as believers. First, James starts off by telling us that we really need to listen more. L look at verse 19. He says, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear. James is saying that we need to listen more. It's a lost art. James says, incline your ear to hear really what is going on. There's a big difference from hearing and listening. That They have to be combined truly for them to work. See, I may hear a sound uh, in the car while I'm listening to my song, a song I want to hear. The sound I hear in the background, I may not pay any attention to it, but I hear it. That may be your children playing, screaming, and you have dulled them out, so to speak, and tuned in to the music because you don't want to hear it. But think about those critical moments where you're hearing, you're listening to what your kids say, and you dwell on it. And then as a parent, you're able to give them some type of instruction or because you're really listening to not only what they said but what they did not say. James is saying that as believers we have to listen more. When it comes to the Word of God, be quick to listen. When it comes to other people, be quick to listen. Now this is a tall task because um, so Quickly, that's not what we, often that's not what we want to do. And listening is, uh, let's put it like this, listening is life changing. See, when you're in a classroom and you're listening to the teacher while the other students are not listening, there's a greater chance, greater opportunity that you're going to do better at that particular subject than those who were not paying attention. When you're in your workplace, there have been some people that have received a promotion or had an opportunity to do something that you were not allowed to do because they actually paid attention to the art of listening. Now, if you were running a business and the business called for uh, a, a lot of safety measures. But you got a knucklehead on the team. He, he doesn't listen too often. 
you don't take that person and put them in charge of safety measures because people's lives could be on the line because this person doesn't pay attention. James says, listen, because the Word of God has the ability to transform you and I. But we have to listen to the Word of God. Even now, while we're in this place of worship, you may easily be distracted by your phone vibrating. Now, you put it on mute but you just got a vibration on your phone. That means a text message came in. Even for that second, even though you didn't even look at it, the thought, I just need to look at it as soon as he gets to a little break. Uh, if, if everyone just get to a point, if they can laugh about something, say amen about something, as soon as their eyes are off, it, I'm, I, I just need to look down at my phone real, very quick so I can see what this message is about. It's a, it's a distraction. J, J, James is saying, don't allow yourself to be robbed by not listening. You have to tune some things out. And, and, and James is trying to say this, listen quickly. Be quick to listen. Now, now notice how he said it. He said, but everyone be quick to hear. In other words, James is painting this picture of pursuing the opportunity to listen. He says, be quick about this. And, and, and I, I remember I used to, in the, uh, around senior adults when I was working in an assisted living, I would love to hear that conversation. I cannot tell you how it has been a blessing to me as an adult to take the time to be quick to listen to someone else, especially senior adults. And honestly, if you listen carefully, sometimes they'll talk, they'll, they'll, they'll be sharing some matters amongst each other or with you that will be, that, that you see as a positive in their life. But sometimes if you listen, they're willing to share with you some negatives that took place in their life. The beauty of it all is that you can learn from their positives or their negatives. If they tell you that, hey, I used to do this, but I fell down. From doing it. It brought me great trouble. That can be a very helpful resource to you, but you have to be quick to listen. Now, I must admit, there were some conversations that I heard, and they were just downright funny. I, I remember one senior adult, she said uh, she had went for therapy, water therapy, and they put her in a whirlpool. She had never been in a whirlpool before, and uh, she came back. She said, I'm going to call my kids. She was telling uh, the director, I'm going to call my children, tell them come and get me because these people have taken me and put me inside of a washing machine. And uh, so, so, so you, you, you just have to listen. <laughs> and, uh, but be quick to listen, James is saying, and, and, and make it a pursuit of yours. And James is saying, do this all the time. No matter who you are, no matter what your age is, be quick to listen. Because the truth of the matter is, you and I don't know it all. He says, be quick to listen. Listen more. You can't get enough of it. Uh, two, he says this. Slow to speak. In other words, talk less. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says it this way. God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Do you get that? God is in heaven, you are on earth, so let your words be few. In other words, God is saying, you don't know what I know. Because you're on earth. And uh, you're not as smart. I'm not as clever. I'm not as wise, you're not as wise as we believe we are at times. Talk less. Proverbs 29, 20 says this. Do you see a man who speaks in haste? 
there is more hope for a fool than for him. And Ogden Nash, he put this principle into a neat little rhyme. I like when he said, he said, to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup. Whenever you're wrong, admit it. When you're right, just shut up. Such <laughs> neat little rhyme, but so much truth to it. The, the, the more we talk outside of the Word of God, when, when we're angry, because you're going to see how they all connect, the most likely we're going to get in trouble. See, how many marriages have failed because of unkind words? How many marriages are holding on because of unkind words? How many relationships have come to an end because of unkind words? Let me bring it back to this, because in our time and age, it's not just what we say verbally, but there are many who sit behind their computer screen on Facebook a tweeting and they respond or put a comment out a little snarky comment something that's negative they put it out and they chuckle about it something nasty distasteful ugly or, or, or they call themselves sometimes being slick Many of these people are Christians who are doing this. I know, because I know many people like this. And they, they'll put a comment out that's unkind to a person. And later down the road, they'll think about it and go back to delete it. Unfortunately, the internet owns it. Whatever you put out on the internet, whether it's a word, whether it's a picture, it's out there forever. You may have deleted it from your profile, from your computer. You may have torn up your computer with a hammer. It's still out there. Hiding behind a desk, sending out comments, ugly comments that we try to take back. It's unbecoming of a child of God. James is saying, talk less. Don't, just be quiet. Every time you see something out there ugly or negative, even if it's directly to you, indirectly or directly, there's no need to respond to it. Sit on it for a while. Think about it for a while. Ponder it for a minute because once you put it out there, it is out there. Talk Less. You remember growing up, uh, you heard, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, that sounds really good. It sounds quite brave, whoever wrote that. And it really works well for the person who doesn't have any feelings. But for people who have feelings, sticks and stones, yes, they might break my bones, but eventually they are healed. Words take longer to heal. And sticks and stones, they're known to break bones, but words break hearts. Be careful what you and I say is what James is pushing here. Talk less. But James says this. He says, be slow to speak and slow to anger. James is saying this. Calm down. All right, calm down. Don't just explode because of your trial or what, whatever you're going through. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many people believe that I, got, I have to keep it real. There's nowhere in the Bible where that's translated, keep it real. Now, and, and, and listen, now, I, I, I'm not the only one in here that has read Genesis through Revelation. It's not even in the table of contents or in the dictionary I got. Uh, keep it real is not there. Tell it like it is, that's not in there. In, in, in fact, if you really want to get down to it, you go to Ephesians chapter 4. It says, uh, speak the truth in love. Telling it like it is, is not a thing that a Jesus follower should be doing. 
calm down. Some, some, some of us have a mouth like a shotgun. First thing that comes to mind when we upset, we just let it out. Bah! We don't consider who it's going to hurt. But you know, a shotgun cannot give you an accurate aim. You're going to do more damage than you, what you even originally intended. And you can't take that back so easily. But notice the progression. James says, be quick to listen. Slow to speak, slow to anger. Here's what James is saying. Those who are quick to listen are less likely to talk themselves into a situation where they become angry. Do you realize when you and I don't listen and we're, 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 we're going back and forth with someone, the more we talk, most likely the angrier we're going to become. I keep talking, I'm working myself up into uh, uh, th this, this rage. Because what James has in mind here is not just anger as we think of anger. The word is translated here as a deep-bedded rage that just becomes rooted. And it just, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a wife who was upset with her husband because he, did, he hasn't been cutting the grass. And she's been upset for the last seven years. She talked to him about it the first five years. The last two years, she, she hasn't talked about it much. But it's just building and building there. On top of it, she's adding other negatives to it. He's also home five minutes late. He don't fill up my car with gas. He don't smile back at me when I smile at him. I don't like the shirt. Things just start adding up. And before you know it, now there's a situation. He was supposed to cook chicken. He cooked chicken thighs instead of chicken breast. All of a sudden, they going back and forth. Kids trying to figure out what's going on. World War IV, it looked like it's about to go off. And they're going back and forth, and the argument is over chicken thighs or chicken breast. But it goes back to the grass not being cut seven years ago. And it's not, now she's not angry. She's full of rage. And she's telling him, you're not even a man. If you were doing this, you would. It went somewhere. And, and it just comes out. And the more she talks, the angrier she becomes. But James also says this, the more angry you and I become, most likely, the more we're going to talk. So the more we talk, the angrier we become, and the angrier we become, the, more, the longer we talk. Because why do we talk more? Because now if I'm going back and forth with her, if I'm going back and forth with you, Miss Lewis, I'm upset. I must have the last word. Now, she may have said at the end of the argument, all right then, whatever you say. Now, to you all, it might sound like, well, that, that shit let it end. No, I don't like the way you said whatever, whatever you say. You, you've been smart. You've been a smart at me. So now we, go, we just keep going and going and going, and the thing never, ever rests. A year down the road, it comes back up. James is saying, watch that as believers, because if you and I were to have listened more on the front end, it would have caused us to actually consider that person, not only what they're saying, but what they're not saying. Some of you may have grown up in a situation where you weren't happy with the, some of the parenting that you may receive. And you may hold a grudge against your parents for it. But have you ever taken the time to really ponder what your parents been through, not as adults, but as kids. To give you an example, my dad has always thought he was a good dad. I mean, far as, like, uh, but he has not, and he was not. But then it clicked to me one day, something he was saying when he was talking to me and another, one of my, one of my brothers. 
He's comparing his track record to his dad. And his track record with his dad is not good. Just like mine is not good. So when you listen more, it makes you more considerate of what a person has been through and what shaped them and made them who they are. It makes you more compassionate and understanding. I'm not saying you're saying you're going to be in a position where you say, well, that justified them doing wrong or that's right. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it makes you more understanding. The more you and I listen, the more understanding we will become. Listening leads you to understanding. That's why you and I talk less. It makes us more considerate. We all have different backgrounds and in order for a family to be healthy a church to be healthy we have to listen more do you realize uh, some of you who have not yet become married and have had kids you may not be considerate with your parents but you got to think one day you're going to be a parent also parents you may look at your kids and say this is their experience but everyone's perspective in a household is going to be a little bit different so one of the things though that helps is listening seeking balanced understanding and it's going to require that you talk less um, and in order to listen it's going to recall for you to take those same letters that are in the word listen where you can spell the word silent the same let the same letters in the word listen are the same amount of letters and the exact same letters that are used to spell silent. Well, I just want to give you some takeaways that will help us. But before I go there, I just want to tell you, verse 21 says it like this. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word and plant it, which is able to save your soul. Do not let anger do not let uh, the bitterness of rage, and remember this deep-seated seated, uh, seated rage or wrath, don't let, and, and talking and not, and failing to listen, rob you of the opportunity for the Word of God to change your and my life. But in order for you and I to do it, we're going to have to humble ourselves to the Word of God. We're going to have to yield to the Word of God. Now, the Word of God is going to come through you and I studying the Word. The Word of God is also going to come through you and I praying. The Word of God is also going to come through you and I seeking godly counsel from other believers. And so there's all types of uh, sources to bring in the Word of God. But when you and I hear the Word of God, do not fail to humble yourself to a higher authority because the Word of God is God's Word and so it should have the final say-so in your and my life. It, it is the number one reason when I sit down and I counsel a, uh, a, a, a couple, I will say to them, listen, I'm going to share some things that you will perhaps not agree with. And you're going to say some things that I probably won't agree with. But can we all agree before we start that God has the final say so? Now, if they say no, 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 you know what I'm going to say? Well, this meeting is over. Because if God has no say-so, we're just wasting our time. You come back when you're ready to hear the Word of God. So James is saying, humble yourself to the Word of God so that the Word of God, which is to be implanted in you and I, can make the change in us that it is supposed to change. To take, it has to take root. Now, in order for it to take root, James is saying, put aside all filthiness. So what James is saying is, all that mess, all that rage, all of that anger, all, toss it to the side so that there can be space for the Word of God to find its place and to grow. And uh, uh, s s several weeks ago, uh, we had to lay some sod down in the yard. But before we could lay the sod, we had to till up the ground. Where, the salt, where, where old grass was. But guess what? It wasn't grass in the first place. It was weeds. Here's the point. We thought we had some grass and it was just scattered in the backyard in certain places. Most of us 
uh, if we're not careful, we, go, we say we're going to go outside and cut the grass. Most of us not even cutting grass, perhaps. We look at something and see it green, and we call it grass. No, weeds are gra- green too. And they grow faster than grass. But you have to get rid of the weeds. Till it up, you have to spray it, and you have to make sure the ground is set before you put the grass down. Because if you just come out and put fertilizer on the weeds and the grass, you're feeding the grass and the, fer- um, and the weeds. So you have to switch to something called like weed and feed, where it feeds the grass, but it kills the weeds. Many of us, we, put, we want to put the word of God in, but at the same time, we want to hold on to our filth also. James has said, put that mess to the side. Let the word of God has, have the, the uh, opportunity to do what God wants it to do in you and I, and that is mature us, change us, that we may become more like Jesus Christ. I want you to walk, I want you to take these uh, with you, some, some points. One, bef- going forward, before we, um, when, when, when you find yourself in a conversation with someone, um, spouse, kids, work, uh, uh, your, 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 your um, co-workers, before you speak or before you type an email, uh, before you send a text message, I want you to think. I want you to think. Now, now listen, I'm, I'm, a, I'm going to sit down, but I want you all to say this with me. Think. Okay. I want you to think before you actually speak, type, or text. I often tell my kids there is never a time where uh, you're supposed to take your thinking cap off and lay it on the rack. Think. And here's what think is going to mean for us in this particular context. T, ask yourself before you speak, before you text, before you send an email, is it true? Is this a fact? Is it an opinion? Is this my feeling? And be very clear about this before you actually speak, type, or text. If this is an opinion, then you, you don't know if it's true. If you heard it from second hand or third hand, you don't know if it's true. If it's based upon your feelings, you might not want to send that. Because our feelings get us in trouble all of the time. I just felt like I needed to tell him. H, ask yourself, is it helpful? Does it help the situation? Does it help them? Does it help you? If it does not help, it most likely is doing the opposite. Is it inspiring? Does it improve with just silence? Sometimes the best thing to do is just be quiet. In, is it even necessary? Would it be better left unsaid? Some of us. I just got to tell her. Like, no, you don't. No, you don't. That's how gossip gets spread. That's how misinformation gets spread. Uh, it, 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 listen, misinformation can destroy relationships. It can destroy churches. If all the information you have is information that you gathered off of someone's counter, then you didn't wait long enough for them to slip it in the oven for it to be baked. You just got some dough and you start sharing with everyone else about the dough. K, is it kind? What is your true motivation for communicating? Because some of us will say we kind and just, you know, I'm a Christian. Well, here's what I found out about Christians. Christians are described as sheep. And I and you should never be deceived that everyone who comes to church is a sheep. And from a distance, sheep sheep and goat look the same. You have to get up close sometimes and make an an inspection. And on top of that, 
just because they are a sheep. Don't get too comfortable because sheep have teeth and sheep bite. And then you have what is called baby sheep and then you might have a mature sheep. Also, the Bible describes us as sheep because sheep are some of the most foolish animals there are. And they need help. Sheep falls down, get on his back, and needs some help to roll over. A sheep has to have a leader. Be careful because sometimes we don't think before we speak type of text. So I know in the closing of this message, I know I have uh, by default removed some of you from uh, your Facebook page half of the time now. You all may not know this about me, but if you pay attention to my Facebook page, I rarely ever put anything on it. It's because by the time I think through, if I want to put that on there, I reason that probably not a good thing to put on there. If I put on it that I'm on a vacation in Florida, somebody might come in my house and take what I got in Georgia. It can be taken the wrong way. Uh, if I compliment someone, someone may say, now he, he, he put a, a, a heart shape on her Facebook page. He must have some interest in her. Now, so sometimes I just rude, I just let leave it alone. It, 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 it's not necessary. Go back to my, it's not necessary. And then that's a lot of wrong I do sometimes, I, I mean, that I see out there and I want to respond to it. But sometimes the way I want to respond to it really ain't that kind. So I just leave it alone. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to see me on Facebook, uh, Facebook page. You're going to start seeing a lot. lot but I'm, I'm learning how to, I want to manage myself on it. And as a church, we should all manage ourselves on it. If you can't manage yourself on it, then just close your account down and sit down somewhere. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and, and, hey, and, and Pastor Tony, I'm going to tell him like my grandma used to say, just sit down. Because uh, in her mind, you were already sitting down. So just sit down somewhere. If you can't do right when you talk to someone, text or send an email, just don't send it. Don't text it. Just close your account down, whatever you have to do, if you can't manage yourself on it. Because you don't want to put a stain on the body of Christ and you don't want to get in the way of your own blessing. Let's pray. Yeah. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, dear Lord, for leading us to truth. Now, Lord, help us to live out truth. Help us, Father, to make this a applicable in our lives. Help us, Father, to relay it to our family, to our friends, Father. Help us, Father, to protect the dignity uh, that is called for to be a child of God, to be a Jesus follower. And let us hold this up with honor, Father, that we may bring pleasure to you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.